So now we'll talk about uh, complications of peritoneal dialysis. So I've already told you about uh, the really good reasons to consider peritoneal dialysis. The United States has got one of the lowest rates of use of peritoneal dialysis among uh, developed uh, countries. Studies of quality of life show that when the patient is at home, they have a better quality of life compared to in-center hemo. So this goes for home hemo and PD. It's a daily dialysis. The patient is autonomous. As I said before, there's better preservation of residual kidney function. And in fact, it may even be renal protective. And we and others have shown that uh, if you look at the rate of decline of, uh, of renal function leading up to the patient going on PD, and then they go on PD, that the slope of the decline actually lessens. So that's kind of interesting too. So a lot of good reasons to choose PD. I think quality of life is the overarching one. But why not choose PD? Well, as my friend John Burkhardt says, to put someone on hemo entails two telephone calls. Uh, you call up and say, can we get a line in? And then you call the hemo unit and you start dialysis. Like it's easy, easy, easy. There's more work up front to start a patient on peritoneal dialysis. First of all, you have to educate the patient so they buy into the idea of uh, home dialysis. You gotta get someone who knows how to put in PD catheters and make sure that they work. You've gotta train the patient, you gotta think about the prescription, and you can see it's a, it, it's a sophisticated prescription. It's not four hours, three times a week. There's constant glucose loading from the PD solution, and we just know for many different reasons that there's limited technique survival in many centers, especially those that don't have a lot of patients on peritoneal dialysis. As I say, if they burn the toast in the morning, they get switched to hemodialysis. So here's a patient who uh, attends dialysis education class and decides to do PD. The catheter is uh, put in and she comes to start training and the fluid goes in fine, but it's very slow outflow. The first half a liter takes the better part of half an hour, which is way too long, and then the flow essentially stops. So this is an example of catheter-related problems. For some reason, this happens very soon after implantation. Once the catheter gets going, it's unusual two years later, for example, to have catheter problems. This is something at the beginning. So there's two-way obstruction where nothing goes in and nothing comes out. And there's one-way obstruction, which is like the patient I've described here, with good inflow but poor outflow. And then I'll briefly discuss pain with inflow and outflow. This is what is not necessarily a problem. A brand new patient gets their first one liter put in and it goes in just fine and then they're put on drain and 500 mils comes out just fine but it's only 500 mils. And if it's an experienced PD nurse, they won't even bother you with this. But if it's an inexperienced uh, PD nurse, they may call you and ask what they should do next. And the issue here is that that first liter into the empty peritoneal cavity, a lot of that fluid is gonna go into pericolic gutters and places like that where it's not accessible to be drained out again. So that's why less than the whole liter may come out, may not come out when you drain. So the thing that you would do next is to put in another liter. And therefore you've, you've filled up like a critical volume that you can now do inflow and outflow exchanges. So a two-way obstruction, nothing going in, nothing going out, is usually a kink or a bend in the catheter, something stuck in the catheter lumen. And uh, you, there's a bunch of things you can do. If you have a good interventional radiology uh, department, they can put a, a trocar in to try to get out. Well, first of all, the, if it's just fibrin or something, again, a good PD nurse will do something called suck and flush, where they put a syringe on the catheter and they push and pull, and they can very often uh, uh, loosen up hunks of fibrin or blood clots and things like that. If it's a kink in the catheter, then uh, sometimes radiology can put a, a little uh, wire in and try to straighten up uh, the catheter. So this is uh, one of our patients who had a fibrin plug and the nurse did the suck and flush and was able to suck out this uh, piece of uh, fibrin. And this is what I call the mother of all fibrin plugs. So this is a patient with a coiled PD catheter. 
And uh, actually, this had to be done under laparoscopic uh, guidance, but you can see the coil. And this is all fibrin. This whole thing is fibrin. And even where the holes are, you can see where the fibrin is. OK. And here's a catheter dye study. So this is dye put through the peritoneal catheter. You can see that it makes a, a kink here, and therefore there's, there's a very poor flow there. And that can be unkinked radiologically. <clears throat> The more common thing you're going to see is one-way obstruction. And that is, again, the fluid goes in OK, but it's poor coming out. And the commonest cause of that is constipation. Other things that can cause it is if the catheter migrates up into one of the upper quadrants, or if the omentum has wrapped around the catheter. And that's why, uh, unless someone has a long, shaggy omentum that goes all the way down into the pelvis, it's one of the reasons why you have to make sure that the PD catheter goes down into the pelvis and out of the, out of the way of most omentums that are, go to like mid-abdomen or something like that. So we are super careful about cleaning out the bowel before the patient goes for insertion of a PD catheter because constipation is the main cause of poor function. Uh, you can try to manipulate the catheter. I think it's better to do it laparoscopically if you've got a laparoscopist who knows what they're doing to try to see what's going on. If it's flipped up, they can unflip it. If it's kinked or something, they can unkink it. Uh, and if it's uh, omentum that's wrapped around the catheter, it can be um, uh, unwrapped. And then there's something called omentopexy where the, the person just tacks the omentum up under the diaphragm and keeps it hanging high up in the abdomen so it's out of the way of the PD catheter. So this is a laparoscopic view. You can see the coiled catheter here. Here's part of the coil here. Here's part of the coil here. And this is omentum that has wrapped itself around the catheter. So in the case of our patient with a one-way obstruction, her flat plate showed loads of stool in the, in the bowel, and that's typically what you see. And the catheter tip is not too bad. It's sort of in the left middle quadrant. Now, it could have been just lifted up there because there's so much stool in the sigmoid colon or something like that. So you assume that this is due to uh, constipation. So she's given lactulose and a tap water enema, and the nurse tells you that there's good results. Are you happy with that? Are you happy with good results? OK. You don't be necessarily happy, because good results could just be one bowel movement, and the person could be chock-a-block uh, with stool. So uh, there, as I said, there can be 15 bowel movements behind there. So she's sent home for the weekend with lactulose and lots of senna. She has a lot of bowel movements. And this is usually where the story ends. Usually at this point, the outflow picks up a little bit and gets better and better, and you've solved the problem. That's in the majority of cases. Unfortunately, in this patient, there was still no improvement in the outflow. So what you can do, as I said, is a catheter dye study where you, under sterile conditions, inject dye to fill up the catheter and spill over into the peritoneal cavity. I showed you an example of the kink in the catheter. You can just see complete blockage, or what I call a peritoneal compartment problem, which is because the catheter happened to be put in between two sets of adhesions and therefore has defined its own little sub cavity. So here's an example of that compartment problem. Here's the uh, catheter going in, and this is the dye here, which should spread out through the whole peritoneal cavity, but instead you see it's like this pocket here, and that is because there's adhesions here and adhesions here, and unfortunately the PD catheter was put right into this little sub-pocket uh, between the two adhesions. So that's something else that you can see. Now, in this study, in her, this case, this, the dye study wasn't diagnostic, and uh, you know, you got to talk to the patient. Do you still want to persevere uh, with this? And she did. So she underwent a second laparoscopy, and what we found was the fallopian tube here encasing the PD catheter. Do you see that? So we, last year, we reported this. We had five cases of PD catheter non-function in four patients due to the fallopian tube. And remember, the fallopian tube is there to catch uh, eggs as they shed from the ovary. So it's got like contractile elements on it. And in these cases, it goes and it latches onto the PD catheter. You can see the catheter there. <clears throat> 
and here's the fallopian tube grabbing onto it. So uh, the fallopian tube was taken off the catheter, and finally the catheter worked uh, dramatically. So that's what I mean about sometimes there's rocky starts to peritoneal dialysis. It pays off in the end, but you're front-loading all your work, your, uh, work and worrying at the beginning until you've established the patient. So find out if it's one-way or two-way obstruction. They have very different uh, approaches to them. If it's two-way, you may want to do a catheter dye study looking for an intraluminal clot. If it's one-way, do a flat plate anyway. The most likely thing is you're going to see lots of stool in the pelvis, I mean lots of stool in the abdomen, and the catheter may or may not be in the pelvis. Sometimes it's lifted up a little bit out of the pelvis, but it's not flipped up under the liver or something like that. So clean out the bowels, and this may entail a lot of bowel movements, and then recheck. If there's no uh, improvement, see if, in fact, you did clean out the bowels. Sometimes the patients go home and say they took the laxatives, and they didn't. And if the catheter is in the right place, it could still be that, or it could be that it is in the right place, but the omentum or the fallopian tube or something is wrapped uh, uh, around it. And that's where perhaps a diagnostic laparoscopy can be very helpful to find out what's going on and free up the peritoneal catheter. Okay, painful inflow and outflow. Uh, is, is unusual, but not terribly unusual. And both of them can be treated by something called tidal PD. So I just want to make sure you're familiar with that. And that is where you leave in a residual volume. Instead of two liters going in, two liters going out, two liters going in, two liters going out. In this example, it's 85% tidal, where two liters goes in at the beginning, and then you just take out 1.7 liters, or 85%. So you're leaving in a residual volume of 300. And then you put in 1.7, out 1.7, in 1.7, out 1.7, and you're leaving this residual volume until the very end when you do your final drain, where you drain it all out, where the patient may or may not have some discomfort. This is good for painful inflow and outflow. Tidal was originally introduced as a way to try to improve dialysis adequacy, but we use it now more for uh, discomfort with inflow and outflow. Okay, this is a patient on PD for a couple of years and is on some sort of exit site prophylaxis. We use mupiracin at the exit site as part of the exit site care. And they present with an exit site infection. It's swabbed and it grows serratia. What would you do with this patient? Serratia, exit site infection. Remove the PD catheter and change to hemo for a few weeks. Remove the catheter and replace with a new catheter at the same OR. Change the exit site ointment to either genomycin or that's supposed to be fluconazole. Yeah, exit site infections are really uh, are, are really tough. I don't think you necessarily have to remove the PD catheter without at least giving a trial of therapy, either oral or local application of antibiotics. I certainly would not remove and replace at the same OR with a nasty bug like serratia, because you've got to be really worried that your new catheter is going to become contaminated just from being in the same OR field as removing the infected one. So uh, I think uh, what I would do here is try exit site genomycin, which has got better activity against serratia. Plus or minus, you might want to give oral antibiotics. I've never been terribly convinced that oral antibiotics uh, help for exit site infection, but it, it's worth a try. Okay, so uh, it's, I remember when I started PD years ago, every other patient who came for clinic had pus at the exit site. It was so prevalent. And when we started using uh, prophylactic mupiracin at the exit site, exit site infections almost disappeared. So we still use mepiracin. Other people use genomycin. This is a, a tri-hospital study from the United States where they did genomycin versus mepiracin. In their hands, genomycin actually came out better than uh, mepiracin. This is a time to first exit site infection in this randomized controlled trial. And you can see that genomycin uh, did better, even at preventing gram-positive uh, exit site infections. So uh, 
whatever you use, I think that any regular uh, application of antibiotic ointment is really important. We have, as I said, we've seen our exit site rec uh, infection rate go down to almost nil with that. I'll just tell you, the reason I don't like genomycin is these are two of my patients who I switched from mepiracin to genomycin for uh, grab-negative exit site infection, and they both developed yeast at the exit site. These are the satellite lesions. It got better with the use of uh, canestin at the exit site, but, uh, and certainly in that study I showed you, they did see yeast as a complication of using genomycin. But if the patient can't afford mupiracin, genomycin is a lot less uh, expensive, and it's certainly worth it, and this yeast uh, is a, a rare thing. This is a patient who is a diabetic and has had three episodes of peritonitis in the last five months, just terrible, loads of antibiotics for all of this. He presents with another peritonitis, but this time it's candida paracelosis. Okay, so fungal peritonitis is a serious complication. Uh, it leads to technique failure in many of, of the patients. We just looked at this again, and uh, only about a third of the patients who had their catheters taken out were able to return to PD. Or put another way, up to a third of patients can successfully return to peritoneal dialysis if they've had their catheter taken out and switched to temporary hemo because of a fungal peritonitis. And there's a high mortality mortality rate. Um, I don't think it's because fungal peritonitis is such a horrible peritonitis, but it tends to be very sick, frail people who've gotten lots of antibiotics for lots of different reasons who develop fungal peritonitis. And I think the mortality is more related to the kind of person who gets it rather than the organism itself. So these are the risk factors for fungal peritonitis, frequent peritonitis, lots of antibiotic therapy, especially intraperitoneal antibiotic therapy for bacterial uh, peritonitis. So this is what I think goes on. This is supposed to be a loop of bowel, and normally the fungi and the bowel and the bacteria live in a, a peaceful coexistence. And then you add in antibiotics, loads of antibiotics to the mixture, and you get fungal overgrowth in the bowel, which leaks out into the peritoneal cavity. I think that's the mechanism how lots of antibiotics leads to fungal peritonitis. So what we do is if a patient's going to be on antibiotics, we give fungal prophylaxis. This is only proven to work in units where they have a lot of fungal peritonitis. If it's a rare event, it's hard to prove that it works, but I still think it's worth it. So we will put patients on antifungal prophylaxis if they have to be on antibiotics, either for a bacterial peritonitis or your diabetic who, who has a necrotic toe and is put on like two different oral antibiotics for the next eight weeks, something like that. We put these kinds of patients on antifungal prophylaxis. We tend to use Nystatin. Other units will use a low-dose fluconazole. Uh, Nystatin may be inconvenient, but there's really no side effects from it. It's really just a matter of remembering to take it. So if someone has fungal peritonitis and you take out the catheter, then what? Uh, no one knows how long they have to stay on hemo, probably one to three months. As I said to you before, about a third of our patients were able to return to peritoneal dialysis. So it's not necessarily game over for the patient, and don't lose track of them when they're on hemo. They, they may want to stay on hemo, or they may hate, hate, hate it, and want to come back to peritoneal dialysis. So do revisit coming back to PD with them. After her uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, removal of the fallopian tube, she's back on APD, and three days after discharge, she calls the unit complaining of shortness of breath. And there's a bit of a cough, but no infective symptoms, and a chest x-ray is ordered. And this is her chest x-ray. So unusual for a brand new PD patient to be short of breath that if you do have someone like who's new to PD, you gotta think about this right away. 
So this is uh, PD hydrothorax, which is where the fluid moves from the peritoneal to the pleural cavity under a pressure gradient. It's very uncommon, but uh, you know we've had three cases in the last six months. We went years without seeing it, and we've had three in the last six months. So it's movement across probably microscopic or tiny holes in the hemidiaphragm from the peritoneal to the pleural cavity. And it may be asymptomatic, or the patient may com complain of shortness of breath, no surprise, or diminished effluent return because uh, some of the fluid is going up into the pleural cavity and it's not coming out with the drain. It's almost always right-sided. And you can do a thoracentesis both for release of symptoms, for relief of symptoms, or diagnosis. One, geez, one of the uh, the patients we just had, we we took out like more than five liters. Uh, from, I mean, we were worried about expansion pulmonary edema, so we did it in steps. But we ended up taking up more than five liters uh, from her hydrothorax. It's a tri uh, transudate. Everyone talks about the high glucose concentration because, of course, if it's PD fluid, like. Um, you know, a 1.5% has got a glucose concentration of 1,360 milligrams per deciliter. So if it goes up in the pleural space and you tap it, you should see a high glucose concentration. The only, it's not all, often like that. I think it's because as the fluid sits there in the pleural space, just like in the peritoneal cavity, I think glucose diffuses out. So if you don't get around to tapping it for several hours, I think a lot of the glucose may have uh, drifted out. And of course, if the patient's using icodextrin, which is a glucose-free PD solution, then the glucose is also not going to be high. So it's usually a little bit higher than a simultaneous blood sugar, but if you look at the old literature and it says it's like super high, that may not necessarily be the case. The thoracic surgeons love this idea of putting methylene blue into the PD fluid before you tap. And then when you tap, if you see the blue color coming out of the pleural fluid, you've established that there's a communication between the two cavities. In fact, that's wrong for so many reasons. Methylene blue is an irritant, and it really hurts if you put it in the peritoneal cavity. And secondly, it may get over-diluted in the two liters or whatever of PD fluid, and when you tap the pleural fluid, you don't see the blue color at all, even though there is a connection between the two compartments. So it's sort of a bad idea all around. So as I said, if they're very short of breath, a thoracentesis can be very helpful. You should stop PD. Uh, if they're a brand new patient and it was like an elective start on PD, you, you don't necessarily have to shove a line in and do hemo, but if they need dialysis, you probably should do hemo. And then I talk to the patient and I say, if you want to stay on hemo, then um, uh, you know, we don't have to do anything about this. This won't have any kind of ramifications for you. We'll just put you on hemo. If they want to persevere with PD, then they're going to have to undergo a pleuridesis. And we have one poor lady who uh, developed, uh, she was on hemo and she hated it. And she came to PD, got her catheter in, promptly got a hydrothorax, uh, went back to hemo, hated it. So she went ahead for pleuridesis, uh, had the pleuridesis, came back to PD, had another hydrothorax. Thorax. In other words, the pleuridesis wasn't 100% effective, went back to hemo, hated it, and she just had her second pleuridesis. So, I mean, there are some people who really do want to persevere with peritoneal dialysis, but it's a talk you have to have with the patient. Don't automatically assume because they, they have the hydrothorax that they want to give up on PD altogether. And then you can do tall pleurodesis. Some surgeons like to do uh, a pleuroscopic repair, but sometimes these holes are microscopic. And there's really, you can't see where the leak is, and it's a super slow leak. So that's why it's probably just better to do a tall pleurodesis or something like that and cover the whole diaphragmatic surface. Okay. After the pleurodesis, she comes back to PD, and three years later develops abdominal pain, fever, and cloudy PD fluid. Given the absence of fever, this pain is likely not due to PD peritonitis. Typical PD peritonitis rates average about one episode a year in most centers. There's an approximate 20% risk of bacteremia resulting from PD peritonitis, or empiric coverage should be given for the possibilities of both gram-negative and gram-positive organisms. What's the, the true statement here? Good. So 
PD peritonitis requires two of the following three, PD fluid leukocytosis, at least 50% polys. The fluid should dwell for at least two hours before you uh, send it off for a cell count. You know, sometimes PD patients, they may have stopped doing their PD. Let's say they've got pneumonia or something and they're sick and they just can't be bothered doing their PD for a couple of days and they come in and their old effluent is drained out. It may have a cell count of about 300 or something just because it's old PD fluid there, but it'll be monocytic. So that's why the emphasis on the neutrophils here. You know it's not PD peritonitis because it's, it's monocytic. You really need greater than 50% uh, polys for bacterial peritonitis. And abdominal pain and positive culture of the effluent, which of course you don't have right away. Now, what about this seeding? I want to make sure you understand this, that if someone's got a bacteremia from some other cause, it can seed the peritoneal cavity and rarely cause PD peritonitis, rare. But PD peritonitis does not lead to bacteremia. Even the most awful PD peritonitis, if people say, oh, they're so sick, we'll do blood cultures, it's never positive. Never say never, but I can't ever remember it being positive. So PD peritonitis does not lead to bacteremia, which is why if you have a patient who's contemplating dialysis and they've got hardware in their body, be it a mechanical valve, heart valve, or prosthetic hip, or something like that, <clears throat> all things being equal, even if they get the worst PD peritonitis, they're not going to seed their hardware. Whereas, of course, in hemodialysis, if they get uh, bacteremia, then that becomes a, a big, big problem. Okay, so bacteremia can cause peritonitis rarely, but peritonitis doesn't cause bacteremia. So we use antibiotic prophylaxis at times of anticipated uh, bacteremia, such as dental work. We'll do it for upper and lower endoscopy, and that. Not necessarily for bacteremia, but just contiguous uh, infection for colposcopy or any kind of instrumentation before below the waist. We'll give antibiotic uh, prophylaxis and also make sure they go for the procedure empty, not sitting there with two liters of sugar water in their peritoneal cavity. Principles of treatment, start treatment quickly. You've got to cover for both the possibilities of gram positive and gram negative until you know the culture results, and then you can adjust your antibiotics based on that. And you've got to continuously reevaluate the patient to make sure they're getting better with a reduction in pain and send the cell for cell count. I have made the mistake myself where I'm hoping so much for the PD for the peritonitis to get better that it seems to me that the fluids getting clearer, but in fact, you know, wishing doesn't make it so. You should send the cell count and see actually if things really are improving. Uh, consider removing the catheter if uh, there's no improvement after about four or five days, especially with the bad players like Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. Fungal peritonitis I alluded to before, it's really not going to get better uh, with, anti with antifungal therapy. You've got to take out the catheter. So the only exception I would say to this is sometimes people do what I call drive-by PD fluid sampling. Uh, so someone comes in, they've got a sore toe, they're a PD patient, they've got a sore toe, and someone sends off the PD fluid, and it comes back growing yeast but there's no cells in the PD fluid or anything. And something like that, I think just sometimes these things pop into the PD fluid. I wouldn't go and race and take the PD catheter out in something like that. I would just reculture, see if anything comes, do they develop a PD cell count. More often than not, it just disappears. But if someone does present with PD peritonitis and you get a call that there's uh, fungal organisms seen, you might as well get uh, everybody ready to take out the catheter, and as I said before, the catheter has to stay out for some period of time. Most people will keep it out for about four to six weeks at least before putting in a new PD catheter. There are guidelines. If you go to the ISPD website, 
www.ispd.org, you will find the 2010 update. The 2016 has been published, but it's not on the website yet, but you're fine with the 2010 guidelines. Frankly, there isn't all that much difference uh, between the two updates. So it's, if you've got access to the internet, and I do it too, if I get someone who's got uh, Klebsiella peritonitis or something, like an unusual one, I will look it up and just see what the recommendations are for antibiotics for the weird and wonderful ones. Pseudomonas peritonitis, by convention, you use two anti-pseudomonal drugs, whereas most gram-positive peritonitis you treat for two weeks. For the gram-negatives, including pseudomonas, we treat for 21 days. And this is something that's not well understood, but if pseudomonas occurs with a pseudomonas exocyte infection, it means the whole catheter is contaminated with pseudomonas, and you might as well take out the catheter. But if someone's got only a pseudomonas exocyte infection without peritonitis, it's worth a trial of treatment. If they've got pseudomonas peritonitis without an exocyte, I'm sorry, did I say that wrong? If someone's got a pseudomonas exocyte infection but doesn't have peritonitis, or the opposite, they've got pseudomonas peritonitis but don't have an exocyte infection, it's worth a trial of treatment. The only one where you should take out the catheter is if they've got both at the same time, because it implies that the whole catheter is infected with the pseudomonas. And we have successfully treated patients with isolated pseudomonas peritonitis uh, without having to remove the catheter. So it's worth a trial of therapy. So that's why uh, the first three answers are, are wrong, and the best one is that uh, it's recommended that you give empiric coverage for both gram-positive and gram-negative until you know what you're dealing with. Fever is present in about 50% of patients with PD peritonitis. Most units should and do have peritonitis rates of about one episode every three years or, or more. Our unit is clocking at about one episode every six, six years right now. And PD peritonitis, you can never say never in medicine, but between us, it, it never leads to bacteremia. This is a man with polycystic kidney disease. He's trained on uh, Cycler. You can see his prescription, two liters times three overnight, two liter day dwell, doing great. He still has a lot of residual kidney function, and his wife is being worked up as a, a kidney donor. And he comes to clinic, and he said he was bent over someone's sink, and he felt a pop. Uh, and he felt a lump in his groin. So this is supposed to show you. Here's his right groin, which is pretty flat, and here's his left groin here, uh, where you can see a bulge. And that's a, a new inguinal hernia. So one of the complications of peritoneal dialysis is related to raised intra-abdominal pressure, which is also what causes the hydrothorax that I described before. And how much the intra-abdominal pressure goes up depends on how much volume you put in, the position of the patient, how old they are, how big they are, and then patients will uh, fill themselves with fluid, and I, I can tell you stories. One, one guy filled himself with two liters of fluid and suddenly was just dying to go outside and chop wood. So he went outside and chopped wood and popped a hernia. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of things that patients do that transiently raise the intra-abdominal pressure. So just keep this in mind. This is the intra-abdominal pressure on the y-axis, volume of dialysis fluid on the x-axis. And just to show you that the more fluid you put in, the higher the intra-abdominal pressure, but it's lowest with the patient in the supine position. So here's just some examples of uh, ventral hernias. You can see right here and right here. And this is an umbilical hernia, which looks very cute and small, but it's actually the one you should be most afraid of because it's got the biggest risk for incarceration. Those big ventral hernias, bowel can sort of float into it, into the sac, float out again, but these little umbilical hernias have got like a little fibrous ring at its base, and if a little bit of bowel goes into it, it gets stuck there, and you end up all of a sudden with bowel incarceration or even strangulation. So watch out for those uh, umbilical hernias. And I showed you the mother of all fibrin plugs, so I want to show you the mother of all ventral hernias. This man refused to get this hernia fixed. And in fact, I don't even know if it would be surgically fixable. 
So warn patients who do present with hernia, especially the umbilical ones, about the signs of incarceration. I tell the patients they should be able to push it back in even if it pops back out again, but they should be able to push it back in. If they can't push it back in, and especially if they can't push it back in and it hurts, it may be that it's strangulated too. Most hernias should be repaired, uh, or unless the patient doesn't want to or they're too sick. And dialysis around the repair depends on the residual kidney function. Most cases, we don't switch the patient to hemo. And I don't know why, but surgeons, especially in the US, feel like you have to switch them to hemo if you're going to repair a hernia. And that's just not the case. And we have published, and John Crabtree, an American surgeon, has published large case series of patients who were on PD and had hernias repaired without converting the patient to hemodialysis. So you really basically just dialyze them up until the day of surgery, empty them out, let them have their surgery leave them dry for a few days, and then gradually introduce PD like you would in someone with a fresh catheter or the so-called break-in uh, technique. And again, it's, uh, it's not usually a problem, especially if they've got residual kidney function. So our superintendent uh, with the new inguinal hernia was switched to night cycler dialysis, which frankly he should have been on uh, from the get-go. He was left dry during the day. I think with a residual kidney function of eight mils per minute, it would have been okay for him to be dry during the day. He underwent hernia repair and then had no PD for two days and then gradually had reintroduction of his uh, PD, uh, leaving the day when he's active with higher intra-abdominal pressure to the end. And that was reintroduced a couple of months later. Uh, a similar problem of intra-abdominal pressure is leaking of the PD fluid, as I told you in the last lecture, out of the peritoneal cavity. Uh, it can go almost anywhere. And uh, here's an example of the so-called peau d'orange or orange skin uh, complication, which is subcutaneous edema. And what we've done here is pulled the PD catheter away over here just to show you the indentation that the catheter has made in the abdominal wall. Can you see that right in there? Okay, so it's a very puffy looking thing. This is some sort of tear or hernia or something that has led to leak of the PD fluid into the subcutaneous tissues. Here's another one, again, a little more subtle, but you can, see, this is actually leaked through this umbilical hernia here, and you can see this puffiness of the skin. Do you see where the catheter was lying here? Do you see how it's made the indentation? So that, that's just not normal looking. So that's examples of subcutaneous uh, edema due to leak of dialysate, in this case through that umbilical hernia. So you can do CT scanning with intraperitoneal uh, dye. Don't just put the dye itself. If you just take an empty PD patient and put in 100 mils of hypake, it's just going to stain a little puddle in the middle of the peritoneal cavity. You've got to mix the hypake in a, a full volume of PD fluid and infuse the full volume of the PD fluid. Then have them walk around or sit around to raise the intra-abdominal pressure and then take the CT scan. And uh, if you're in a place where they don't do a lot of PD, you may want to discuss this with the radiologist. So here's a young man who presented with scrotal edema. So anything that's white is the high pake in the PD fluid. And you can see that there's PD fluid in both processus vaginales. And he's got a hydrocele here made up of PD fluid. So there's two pathways to genital edema. The processus vaginalis connects the peritoneal cavity with the uh, tunica vaginalis in the scrotum or the labia. And uh, it closes off in fetal life in about 80% of people. But that means that 20% of people, males more than females, still have an open processus vaginalis. So if you put PD fluid into the peritoneal cavity under raised intra-abdominal pressure, it's going to travel through the processus vaginalis and lead to scrotal swelling or hydrocele. And again, it's more common in males and in females, it would be labial edema, but we see it way more often in males.
The other way that PD fluid can get to the genitalia is uh, through uh, some sort of rent or break in the peritoneal cavity, either where the catheter was put in or if there's a hernia or something, and the fluid exits the peritoneal cavity through this rent and travels along the abdominal wall and can end up with edema of the penis or, or the mons pubis in women. So those are two pathways by which PD fluid can lead to genital edema. So this is pressure driven. You can reintroduce low pressure PD, such as lying on their back with low volumes. You can uh, do temporary hemo to see if whatever tore broke up, or you can look for a hernia. Of course, if it's a patent process as vaginalis, it's not gonna get better until you fix it. And that's a pretty easy surgical procedure. It's like the same as one for uh, an indirect inguinal hernia. And again, you don't often don't have to put these patients on hemodialysis, but you just repair the patent process as vaginalis. Okay, this is a patient who uh, uh, became amenorrheic, thought she was pregnant, but unfortunately ended up having advanced kidney disease, decided to go on to peritoneal dialysis, and did really well, felt really good, and her per periods came back, which I always think is such a good sign. And with her second period, she had painless, bloody dialysis effluent. And she went to the emergency room, she was stable, but she brought in what looked like a two liter bag of blood and everyone got in a, a real worry and she was crossed and typed and she had hemoperitoneum, which uh, it's actually only a couple of drops of blood, a couple of mils of blood will make a two liter effluent bag look grossly bloody. So it looks like it's two liters of blood, but it's really just two mils of blood. So just know that the commonest cause of hemoperitoneum is the menstruation. And this is probably, again, uh, when the uterus contracts, not only does it expel endometrium out the cervix, but it also refluxes into the fallopian tubes, which, as you now know, open into the peritoneal cavity, so blood can end up in the peritoneal cavity that way. There's lots of other causes of hemoperitoneum. It can be trauma. Uh, we've seen people with, uh, who accidentally got INRs of 10 and something and will get bleeding in their peritoneal cavity, which is interesting because it probably means non-PD patients are also getting bleeding in their peritoneal cavity, only we just don't see it because we don't have a window into the peritoneal cavity the way we do in a PD patient. So lots of different causes, but the far and away the commonest cause is the menstrual period. But there are serious causes, and if you have a non-menstruating individual and they have bloody effluent, there are things you have to think about. It's not normal, and you should do at least uh, an ultrasound or CT scan or something like that looking for the cause. And this may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, you should use intraperitoneal heparin to try to stop that blood from clotting up in the catheter. Uh, it doesn't make the bleeding worse. You can do flushes in and out until the, the fluid is blood free. If it's active bleeding, you can use unwarmed dialysate, which is cooler than core temperature and will cause vasospasm and stop the bleeding. Again, if it's a woman who gets bloody effluent during her period, then there's really nothing you have to do uh, uh, about it. It's only in the other patients that you have to think about whether they need investigation. And what do you think about this bag? Right, this is chyloperitoneum, very rare. Look for things like lymphoma uh, that can cause this kind of thing. Again, very rare, but if a patient tells you their fluid is cloudy and you send it for cell count and the cell count isn't up and the cloudiness comes and goes and it just seems really weird and you can't figure it out, think about chyloperitoneum. Okay, so constipation is the main cause of outflow obstruction, and you really have to pay a lot of attention to, to bowels. Think of hydrothorax if a PD patient gets short of breath very soon after starting PD. That's a very unusual event, and it really mandates you to look for hydrothorax. Long-term antibiotics are a risk for fungal peritonitis, and I advocate to give fungal prophylaxis. Staph aureus or pseudomonas infection of both the exocyte and the PD fluid is not going to get better. You should take out the catheter. The commonest cause of hemoperitoneum is the menses, and it doesn't need any further investigation in that setting. 
And finally, hernias are actually quite common in PD patients. If you've got at-risk patients with a, a history of a hernia before, maybe if they've got residual kidney function, you want to uh, prescribe night cycler PD dry during the day or a small day volume. And uh, you can repair most of these without switching to hemo. They are unsightly. They can be a source of leak of PD fluid out of the peritoneal cavity into the surrounding tissues. They may also cause bowel incarceration and even strangulation. Thank you very much. I think we have one minute uh, for questions. Yes. Uh, the question is, do you use TPA to unblock catheters that are filled with blood? Yes, you can use those. I haven't had a lot of experience, but it's in the literature that it, it can work, just like a, a, a hemo line. Okay. Yes. You, you know, it's so amazing to us Canadians that one of the commonest questions we get asked from people in America is about peg tubes. Like, we hardly use peg tubes at all, but use a lot of them. We're really scared about peg tubes uh, in patients on PD. I think it's really a high risk for, for PD peritonitis. There's literature in children on, on dialysis who get uh, enteral feeding with pe peg tubes, and there is a higher incidence of peritonitis, including fungal peritonitis. So I'm not thrilled at the possibility of the two. It worked in your case? Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying it won't, it can't be done. I'm just saying they do have a higher risk of infection with it. If you put in the PEG tube, uh, I would just leave it and try to have it uh, seal up before you resume the PD. Is that what you did? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Do you think the diabetes worse? Yes. PD makes diabetes worse, there's no doubt. If you have someone who's diet-controlled diabetic and you're putting them on PD, I warn them that they're probably going to have to go on oral hypoglycemics. If they're on oral hypoglycemics, I warn them that they're probably going to have to go on insulin. And if they're on insulin, they're probably going to need more insulin. Yes. Yes. It, it, you know, the one I showed you with the peau d'orange was a lupus patient who had been on like tons of prednisone, and we were so worried she was going to leak, and she did leak, and we just stopped, tapered her prednisone. We, we couldn't find the source of the leak, and we put her on hemo for about a month, brought down her prednisone, and then re-challenged her with PD, and she didn't leak. So I don't know if it's like little tears or something, and if you give them a rest from the stretch of the PD fluid, maybe it can seal up again. I say in most of the leaks, you do see the cause. And most commonly, it's an occult hernia that you may not be obvious, especially if the person is overweight. You, you may miss the hernia unless you do like a CT scan. Yes, behind you. So... <laughs> This, so, you know, they're patients and they're really sick cirrhotics and they've got ascites and they're, they're going into renal failure and they're getting weekly paracentesis and people say, why don't we just put them on PD for their dialysis and then you'll be draining the, the fluid at the same time that you're doing the PD. Oh, it sounds like a great idea. And you know what? It never works for us. We have tried it and it never works, but I'll tell you there is a literature that it does work in other people's hands. Uh, especially in Europe, they will they will use PD for for uh, renal replacement for patients who have cirrhosis and ascites, and uh, it, it seems to work swell. But with us, it's just like one complication after the other, and we've had to abandon every time. Now, patients with cirrhosis without ascites and liver transplant patients do very well on PD. It's this like end stage with the ascites that it just doesn't seem to work. We should stop there. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll be at lunch if you if you have questions. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you.